it would be good to stay on time and we're going to have uh, two important talks which are going to expand, clarify, and offer perhaps uh, at least alternative uh, or complementary uh, perspectives um, both on the Missouri and the Colorado. And so the first speaker is Jerry Kenny. Jerry is the executive director of the Platte River Recovery Implementation Program. And um, so perspective, significant river, significant restoration effort here in Nebraska. Could we put up Jerry's program, please? That's the um, laser that's what we need. Very good. Well, thank you and good afternoon. So uh, I'm, I'm here to talk about the Platte River Recovery Implementation Program uh, with the perspective that it is a collaborative program uh, that is providing effective implementation of the Endangered Species Act. So uh, makes it somewhat you, you, it's unique in several respects and being effective I think is one of the uh, unique aspects. So, uh, start with the basics. So there is the uh, Platte River Basin, and the, and the highlighted areas uh, demonstrate the areas that are under the umbrella of the re recovery program. Uh, in particular, notice the, the uh, highlighted region in the Big Bend region in, in central Nebraska there. That is, that is the area of uh, the focus of our activities in terms of land uh, and water acquisition and, and habitat rehabilitation for the, uh, the, the bird species. Uh, we also have an interest in the lower plat uh, below the uh, uh, elkhorn for the, uh, the pallid sturgeon. So what is it we're recovering? And I've hinted at it, it is the endangered species. And, and those are our four target species. And we are a species recovery program, not an eco ecosystem restoration program. So all of our management actions are focused uh, towards the benefit of, of these species. And in the central plat, the, the three bird species, the whooping crane, uh, the interior least tern, and the piping plover. And because of the actions of working towards the recovery of those species, we provide Endangered Species Act coverage for that area that, that, that was shaded, the entirety of the South Platte Basin, the entirety of the North Platte Basin, and the main stem of the Platte River upstream of the confluence with the loop. So what, what does that mean? Well, it provides regulatory certainty to the water users in those basins means that, that the water users can, can continue to go about their lives. The, the uses up through July 1st, 1997 are covered by the work that we are doing as part of the program and it creates a framework that allows future development in the basin. So it is not uh, just about the species, it is very much about the water users as well. So how are we going to uh, you know, work towards recovery of the species? Well, as it is to restore and re rehabilitate habitat. And it's illustrated by you know, the, the image on the, the left, 1938. That's a section of the Platte River near Lexington. It's broad, it's shallow. There's a lot of bare sand habitat, a braided river form. The very same section, 60 years later, 1998, after, you know, on the order of 70 to 80 percent of the flows, the naturally occurring flows have been uh, diverted for uh, uh, decades. You, you have vegetative encroachment and the stream channel is the thin blue line. You know, it's an anastomosed uh, vegetated channel. So restoring habitat means making more of the river look like it did in 1938 than what it does in 1998. A few basics. We are a collaborative program, and uh, that's one of the unique aspects about the Platte River Recovery and Implementation Program. So, w why are we collaborative? What makes us collaborative? 
uh, first there's the, 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 the money and the in-kind contributions. If you consider uh, all of that, it's a 50-50 split between the states and the federal government. So it's collaborative in that respect. Yeah, it is collaborative in that uh, all of the stakeholders have a seat at the table and a vote. And the, the stakeholders are the states of Colorado, Nebraska, Wyoming, two agencies of the Department of Interior, Bureau of Reclamation and Fish and Wildlife for those agencies, as well as water users and environmental and conservation groups. Everyone is at the table, everyone has a, has a vote. So even though Fish and Wildlife Service is the ultimate regulatory authority with regard to the Endangered Species Act, when they are at the table, they are just another person at the table. They have to keep their badges and guns put away. They can, they can bring them out later, but at the table, they're, they're just another vo voice and vote. And then some unique aspects. Other, other federal programs have similar aspects, but unique is independent implementation. Uh, as executive director under, all, under a federal program, all other programs, I would be a federal employee. I'm not. I uh, uh, was, was selected, uh, formed a corporation, and under contract to provide implementation services for, for the program. So the reason that that was done in the plat was uh, to make it truly collaborative. If, uh, if out of the gate, the person in charge of the implementation of the program is someone who is part of an agency sitting around the table, uh, it violates the, the unbiased, independent uh, aspect of collaboration that's required. So being independent, we can serve truly as an honest broker. Our job is not to advocate any particular position. It is simply to uh, f ferret out the truth and present that to the decision makers in the most meaningful, clear manner possible. Closely related to that then is independent science. And uh, that is critically important. Uh, the important decisions are being made, need to be made. And a lot of money is being spent on the science side. So, so the results from the science have to be credible and, and trusted by, by all. And there are some mechanisms that, that are used to accomplish that. Uh, there are a number of advisory committees associated with uh, the program, but, but key among them is the Independent Science Advisory Committee. It's, it's six independent subject matter experts uh, that, that help us in a couple ways. One, uh, they make sure we're doing the right things. So if we want to answer a question, are we looking at the right things that will provide the information that will allow us to answer that question? So are we doing the right things and are we doing things right? So if you need to measure this or that or have a particular protocol, uh, have you you know, are, are you doing it correctly? If you do it that way, will you get the information that could then answer the question? So those are some governance structural aspects of the program that make it unique and I, I think contribute to the effectiveness. So let me now get into why I'm making the bold claim that we're being effective. So there are three uh, major components to, to the program. So there are three areas that we need to get things done. Land, water, and, and adaptive management. And I'll touch upon each of them and, and what we've gotten accomplished there. So. Uh, the land and water, we, we acquire land, we acquire water, uh, we use that to create habitat. And the adaptive management is we do the science to make sure that we are using those resources effectively to truly benefit the species. So uh, with regard to land, we, we were to acquire, protect, and restore 10,000 acres. In the central plat for the three avian species, and spoiler alert, I'm going to tell you where we're at, uh, and then get into the details. Right now, we, we stand at in excess of 12,000 acres, so check those boxes. On the water plan, we are to reduce the deficits uh, to target flows 
uh, by an annual average amount of 130 to 150,000 acre feet per year. So more water in the plat uh, at the right times. And, and right now we've got 90,000 acre feet in, in hand, so not doing so, so well there. And I'll get into that in, in a bit. And uh, the adaptive management plan, uh, do the science, uh, work towards the recovery of the species, and we have met the milestones in that category as well. So in a little more detail in each aspect. So on the land plan, uh, there were a few guiding principles. Um, we're willing seller, willing buyer. We, do, we, we don't have the power of eminent domain. Uh, people didn't have to talk to us or sell land if they didn't want to. Fortunately, uh, they did. Uh, also, very importantly, we pay property taxes. That's, that's the best way to, to keep people friendly in, in that part of the world. We pay taxes. Good neighbor policy. And uh, we also, while our land acquisition is for the benefit of the, tar of the target species, uh, we also open up the land for recreation aspect, and that's that's won us a lot of friends in some demographic areas that may not have cared so much uh, about the other work that we were doing. We tried to buy the land in, in two to 4,000 acre chunks, uh, and we look at the world from bridge segments. It's an easy way to divide it up. This map shows in that central uh, plat area from Lexington to Chapman, the areas that that, that we have uh, uh, acquired. The, the the land shown in green are other conservation areas. The the sort of uh, you know uh, orange burnt sienna, whatever color that is, uh, lands are uh, program lands. Wherever possible, we try to leverage off other conservation lands. Um, but uh, again, uh, have met that, that target. And, and let me illustrate uh, what we mean by habitat re rehabilitation. So this is the Cottonwood Ranch complex. It's in the Overton to Elm Creek stretch of the river. This is what it looked like in 1998, a lot like that other picture. Uh, vegetative encroachment, anastomosed uh, an stream structure. And in 2005, so the program began in 2007, but in anticipation, uh, this is land that was owned by Nebraska Public Power. Uh, they started to do some of the work uh, for which we uh, compensated them once we came into existence. But you can see tree clearing beginning. 2009, uh, uh, the program was in existence. We had established a management agreement and we're uh, taking over the, the habitat rehabilitation there. A lot more tree, killing, tree clearing and uh, you know, channel, uh, channel widening and sediment augmentation. And you see the, in, in the upper left corner an off-channel sand and water facility constructed there as well along with additional tree kill clearing and uh, channel widening. So that's 2016. So, no, that's 2016. So at this point, 2016, that is pretty well, that has pretty well uh, established to the, to the degree that we want. Uh, the channel widths are, are uh, meet the criteria and uh, uh, looking pretty much the way we want it. So just to remind you, that's what it was. Uh, this is an example of another off-channel sand and water. It was in an existing gravel pit that we acquired in 2009. Uh, the mining is continuing on the uh, pit on the right side, but you can see the, the work that we had done to rehabilitate the peninsulas and turn that into turn and plover habitat. And 2016, we're, we're almost mined out. We're working with the aggregate uh, miner. We, we own the property, but uh, uh, they continue to mine it out, and it's almost mined out. So uh, that's an example of creation of, of, of turn and plover off-channel sand and water habitat. 
So that that's you know on the land side. Let me talk about adaptive management and and in the program document, those are the improved production uh, of of uh, the turn and plover in the central plat, improved production or improved survival of the whooping crane during migration, avoid adverse impact to the pallet sturgeon lower in the river, and uh, as you're doing all this, provide benefit to other other species and try to prevent listing of any additional ones. So uh, I think most people here are familiar with adaptive management, but it is a manner in which you can move forward in the face of uncertainty. It allows you to, to learn by doing and uh, answer questions as you move along. You can't wait until you know everything you need to know. Uh, so you have to plunge in and uh, you know start doing things, learning from it. But it's a rigorous process. It's not trial and error. It's a very rigorous, methodical pro process. And these are the instruments by which we you know do the science: big yellow machines, uh, excavators, bulldozers, and uh, uh, this is what those things look like again that the off-channel sand and water at Cottonwood Ranch and that's you know that's a picture of an experiment uh, so there's river habitat there's off-channel sand and water habitat so it allows us to to uh, uh, observe and and determine habitat use by the, the species so gonna do science you monitor and we monitor a lot of different things: physical process, uh, geomorph, physical process, hydrology, streamflow, geomorphology, you know, sediment gradation, sediment loads, um, as well as the species. You know, count the species, calculate productivity, gather a lot of data, and then we use that to answer questions. And uh, a, a form of communication to our governing body, you know, the governance committee. Uh, for those questions, we have the thumbs up, thumbs down, or double thumbs up, double thumbs down. So, thumbs down is the evidence is trending as the answer is no. Thumbs up, the evidence is trending that the answer is is yes. Scratchy headed guy is, you know, we don't know, we don't know yet. Um, double thumbs up or double thumbs down is we have sufficient uh, basis to conclude that the answer is no or yes and and once you've answered the question then then you uh, come to the report the point in the adaptive management process where you have to to adjust and and we answered a question so what do we do next? Well, we implemented a structured decision-making process, which is you, do, you, you get everybody together, you, you know, everybody in the room, you figure out what alternatives you want to you want to look at. You figure out what you need to to measure or know what are the metrics associated with those alternatives that will allow you to make the decision. Then you do a bunch of analysis, you, you comb through your data, you develop models, and you populate tables with the, the values of those metrics, and then you do comparisons. Is this better than that? And eventually you get to the, this is what we're gonna do next. And in adaptive management, you know, that, that all sounds you know, reasonably easy and you know, kind of so what, but it's a big damn deal. As uh, far as we know, we are the only re river recovery implementation program that is actually adjusted based upon what we have learned. Uh, the other programs do tremendous jobs of, of, of uh, designing and implementing and monitoring and gathering data and, and analyzing it, and, and they know that you know, what they're doing may not be what should be done, but for whatever reason, they can't make the adjustment. Uh, our governing committee in June of last year made an adjustment, and we are doing something different than than uh, was originally set out. So we're pretty proud about that. So, uh, so while there are not specific numerical targets uh, as there were for land and water, 
with regard to adaptive management, but just you know, touch upon we're, we're effective in that. Uh, with regard to whooping cranes, you, know, you can see the population growth from you know, beginning in 1940 when they were really truly on the brink of extinction. Uh, you know, now they're up in the 330, 350 in the migratory flock. Uh, if they continue at that rate, sometime in about 2045 or so, we might reach the 1,000 number, which would move them from endangered to threatened. Uh, a little, you know, focusing in the more recent. Uh, again, the 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 increase in in the population, but also very importantly, uh, the percentage of the population that is using uh, the plat. Uh, is increasing as well. So the number's going up and the number that are using the plot are going up. And uh, actually last week, uh, there were 38 whooping crane in the Platte Valley in one night. Now there have been seasons when we haven't had 38 whooping cranes the entire season and we had them in one night. So, uh, you know, that, there are a lot of factors as to why you know, that number and, and if the number is less than that, uh, uh, next year we aren't going to, you know, declare fail, failure, but uh, we're pretty happy about those kind of numbers. Uh, so then let's look at the, the piping plover. Uh, the x-axis, there's, there's time and there's uh, the blue bars is the, air, the acres of habitat. So uh, as that increases, the 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 dotted line or the point and line segment is the the uh, breeding pair count for for piping plover. So as the uh, as the habitat has increased, the the breeding pair numbers have increased as well. And uh, so there's a similar plot there, similar results for uh, the least turn. Uh, so those are those are our you know happy success stories. Let's talk about the water plan and and trying to get water in an over appropriated semi arid basin was a pretty good clue that that was not going to be hard. So unlike health car health care where no one knew it was going to be really hard, we we all knew it was going to be hard. We 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 maybe didn't know how hard hard was going to be, but. Uh, um, so we're supposed to reduce deficits by 130 to 150,000 acre feet per year. When the three states added into the program uh, with their projects, uh, that got 80,000 of it. So uh, we we had 50 to 70 to come up with, and we've only come up with 10. Yeah. So let me further explain a little bit about what reduction to deficits and target flows uh, means other than more water in the river. But those, the black boxy lines that are shown there, so you've got on the y-axis you've got flow and on the x-axis you've got the months, so the, the square boxy black lines, those are the flows that the Fish and Wildlife Service say that's what you need in the river for the species. So the blue line is if you, you know, average conditions, current conditions, that's, that's an average hydrograph. And if you do what we're uh, supposed to do to, to you know, get additional water, you'd have, you'll have the red line. So you can see in the January, February, the, the blue line's actually above the red line. So Retiming water counts. It doesn't have to all be new water. So if you can take some of that January, February water, store it and put it over in April and in the you know, June, July, August kind of time frame, you know, that, that counts. So again, uh, they've, they've, the state's anted in with 80, that left us 50 to 70. And uh, water in hand, we've got about 10,000. So we've, we've got a ways to go. So we can get water by retiming it. We can get water by acquiring it from someone who's using it for something else like agriculture. Or a third category, uh, if we can improve how we reduce consumptive use by how we manage water and put that water in the river, that counts too. And we focused on the first two because uh, quantification of that third category is, is kind of tricky. So uh, 
it's not that it's, it's not that we can't not that it's valid not that it's not good it's just harder to do that so in our defense we spent a lot of time focused on a regulating reservoir that was going to uh, capitalize on uh, flows that was cap that were captured in the central Nebraska public power and irrigation district system uh, and during the non-irrigation season return to the river uh, upstream of Overton. We we're going we to build a reservoir slightly downstream of that, retime the water in that, and that was going to get us 30,000 acre feet. So, you know, we got 10, we, we thought we had 30, boy, we, you know, we thought we were pretty good. We, you know, we're, we're within striking distance. And then costs went up and land acquisition uh, got, got difficult. Turns out if you tell people you want to build a reservoir, that land gets really expensive. Uh, and then there were political uh, institutional things. So it's on hold. It's on hold right, right now. It's not dead, but it's on hold. So we had, uh, we had a hard pivot. And we're going to get the water, capitalizing upon uh, retiming of, of excess flow still. But uh, we have agreements with every ditch company between North Platte and, and uh, Elm Creek uh, to utilize their systems during non-irrigation season to recharge water. But this, the broad scale recharge is, well, let's, uh, f let's flood large areas and recharge water that way. And in the process, we're creating a whipping crane habitat if we do it in the spring and the fall. So let's do some of that. And, and uh, we are underway with doing our first one of those. Because uh, since it creates habitat, we can use some of that land that we've already bought to uh, develop those supply options. And then the... Uh, Second concept is, well, we didn't have a lot of luck about building a reservoir above ground, so let's utilize a technique that's uh, used in other places, the slurry wall. So uh, you either find a gravel pit or, or dig a pit, but as long as you have a, a nice base layer that you can tie the slurry wall into, you, 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 can, you can create a cup. and. Uh, we have discovered that there, from uh, basically Elm Creek West, uh, the the capstone of the Ogallala Aquifer is somewhere between 30 to 80 feet down, uh, and anywhere from 10 to 20 feet or more thick. So. Uh, we can key into that, and we think this is uh, going to be a, a, a good transfer of uh, concept from areas where, like Colorado, where there's actual bedrock means hard rock. Uh, so uh, we have a number of uh, these planned as well. So uh, moving forward, retiming 25 to 30, leases 10 to 12 and a half, Acquire and retire because I don't like to say buy and dry. It pisses people off. So acquire and retire sounds a little more elegant. Uh, but it is clear we're not going to have that water by 2019, which is the extent of our authorization. Um, we need an extension. We've worked pretty hard for the past year uh, to develop that uh, extension. Uh, Looking at an extension to 2032, uh, besides more time, we'll need a little bit more water or a little more money to get the water and do the science that we need to do to make sure that we're using it right. Uh, as this was in another negotiation process, uh, the habitat lands uh, got upped a little bit, an additional 1,500 acres for the Fish and Wildlife Service beyond what we've got, so it's, uh, it's 1,500 more than what we've got. Uh, but in return, uh, the water target was, was lowered to 120,000. With the understanding, we'll do the science, and if we need the larger amounts, we'll go back and we'll, we'll do whatever we need to do to get that. But for now, uh, 
let's see if 120,000 works. We've got to update some environmental documents and we've got to obtain some authorizations and get some signatures and that's uh, particularly in in today's environment not certainly not a slam dunk but uh, one of the reasons that I'm thinking and that I remain optimistic, we've, we've done some preliminary analysis and if you look at the cost of Endangered Species Act compliance with and without the program, you can see that, that uh, the cost with the program is you know, on the order of half of the cost uh, without the program that would be born in the Platte Basin. So you're talking on the order of $35 million a year. So. You're talking tens of millions annually added up. You're talking hundreds of millions of dollars. So it's a good deal. Visit our website. We've got a lot of good information on there. But that's my, my version of the story of the Platte River. So thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, let's take one question. Uh, while we find the next slideshow. Yeah. What do you think the difference is between your board and everybody else's that lets you mm. do it this way? Well, there, you know, there are a couple things with regard to our, our governance committee. One is that even though the, you know, the, the membership, has, you know, the composition in terms of the individual members has changed from the the, the process that preceded the implementation of the program, the cooperative agreement, that was a decade-long uh, effort over which time a great deal of trust and respect had developed amongst the entities at the table. So that continues today and is, you know, and is handed down to replacements to people on the governance committee. So there, there is a good deal of trust and respect on the amongst the members um, and it is of a manageable size so there are 11 members on the governance committee uh, so and some of those represent you know, a larger mass of, of entities and such so downstream water users as, as an example you know that's the NRDs that's the power districts that's the water users downstream of McConaughey that's a lot of entities uh, but they have representatives that, that represent on the governance committee, so it's not it's not scores of people sitting around the table. It's it's a manageable number of people sitting around the table, and with trust and respect, they are able to move forward effectively, you know, with consensus. So uh, uh, we we it sometimes takes a while to get that consensus developed, but. You know, it, 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 it has always worked to this point. So those are a couple. There are probably a lot of other reasons that sociologists would be able to, to discern, but those are a couple key ones that, that spring to mind. Okay, thanks, Jerry. Thank we'll you. have a chance for follow-up questions uh, in the panel. That'll be after our next speaker and last uh, speaker before the panel, uh, Brad Udall. Um, was educated as an engineer, holds an MBA, has led several organizations including the Western Water Assessment and the Getchus Center at the University of Colorado. He now serves as senior water and climate scientist for the Colorado Water Institute in the, at Colorado State University. Uh, he is a real force in uh, Colorado River science and management and uh, I'm sure his presentation today will be provocative. Brad? All right, so good afternoon and thanks everybody for staying. And Chris, thanks for having me here at UNL. So I'm actually gonna try and connect a bunch of this water governance to real live actions with agriculture in the Colorado River Basin. And I'm curious, anybody here get Colorado River water or live in the basin? One person. All right, how many international folks in the room? So this, this, this is Luna, I know you're in that category. Two, maybe a third somewhere, all right. 
So, so you all are kind of Colorado River rookies. And I'm gonna start with about five setup slides and just to kind of tell you why this basin is under so much pressure today. 60 million people will live in this basin by 2020. That's a 12-fold increase from 1900, 12-fold. Fastest growing area in the Colorado. Two-thirds of those live in California. And there are seven basin states, they're all listed. And the only place that isn't growing is Wyoming. And if you've ever been to Wyoming in the winter, that might be your first clue. <laughs> Can I go back there? Ooh, this clicker really is sensitive. All right, so seven states, two nations, 40 million people. It's 1 15th, Luna, the population of the Ganga. It's 1 30th of the flow. It's a tiny little basin, and yet every major southwestern city gets water, most of whom actually aren't even in the basin. So look at all those arrows. 50% of the municipal water in the Front Range of Colorado, an area with 3 million people. Is, comes from the Colorado River. Santa Fe gets water. Albuquerque, of course, 25 million people in Los Angeles, Salt Lake City, even Cheyenne, Wyoming, through a complicated exchange, gets Colorado River water. Um, there are four and a half million irrigated acres. It's about half, I think, the size of the Ganga. Um, and this enormous topographic variability, 14,000 foot mountains all the way down to, to sea level. Uh, and if you look, the arrows there that go into Arizona, there are two of them, to Phoenix and then Tucson, prove the old Western water adage that water flows uphill towards money. That's a $4 billion project there that was built in 1968 called the Central Arizona Project. And it's one of the reasons that this basin is so much under stress, because when that bill was signed in 1968 and my father was one of the representatives from Arizona who pushed so hard for it, and my uncle Stewart was Secretary of the Interior, they did not have the long-term water to actually supply that project. And that has actually created what's known as the structural deficit in the basin. Another look, these lines aren't sediment, they're actually flow. And you can see the Colorado, they're one-eighth the size of the Columbia, less than one-twentieth the size of the Colorado River. If this were a heart, the heart attack would start in the Colorado River, right? So here's the largest U.S. reservoir, Lake Mead, 25 million acre feet. And again, apologies to foreign visitors. I'll have you know that the United States is joined in our use of English units by the economic and global leaders of Liberia and Myanmar. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see Lake Mead dating back to 1935 there. It first fills. Um, it drops in about 1965, because that's when we built the second largest reservoir in the United States, Lake Powell. It then refills into the 80s. And then at the year 2000, it starts this descent. And even the dimmest of dimwits should look at the right-hand side of that graph and go, something is wrong there. And what's wrong there is actually, is it there? No, it's missing, all right. It's something called the structural deficit which is, again, that Central Arizona Project Agreement where they take 1.2 million acre feet out of Lake Mead every year that they actually don't have inflows for. How do they do that or how did they get away with that? Well, it only started in about the year 2000 because the cap wasn't completed until the late 90s and then we started a drought. The lower basin relies on unused upper basin flows. And this is actually the permanent problem in, in the lower basin and it will have to get resolved between the three lower basin states of, of Nevada, uh, California, and Arizona. This is a paper that I just published with my co-author Jonathan Overpeck in February and uh, you can see reservoir levels there in the upper right and that's both reservoirs, Mead and Pal combined, looks very similar to the Mead graph I showed you before. The next image down shows the longward downward trend in Colorado River natural flows. Um, part of that downward trend, we argue in this paper, is due to higher temperatures. Indeed, one third of the recent 20% reduction in flows is due to temperature, we say. And this is very different than an analogous 1950 drought. It's about the same kind of decline in flow, but did not have the warm temperatures. And how do we know this? If you look at precipitation, you can't
cannot explain the river flow decline in terms of the precipitation decline we've seen since 2000. You cannot, and it leaves temperature as the outlier, as the explainer. Um, the image in the middle there below flows, which has a flat line on it, that's upper basin precip, absolutely flat, no trend. Um, you can see the dip in the 1950s, that grayish or tan bar there in the middle, and then the dip again in the 2000 that's not as great. And then finally, the bottom is upper, upward trending temperatures. It's now about 1.6 Fahrenheit warmer in the basin. And what we say is by mid-century at these rates, you could lose 20% of the flow due to temperature-induced declines, and by end of century, 35%. More precipitation can actually balance this out, but to date we have seen no trend. There's no agreement in the climate models that there should be a trend. And there's a new idea that this area of the country is very, very sensitive to mega droughts that last 10 to 35 years that could overrule any at least short-term increase in precipitation. So the rest of this talk is about ag response. And this comes out of a Walton Family Foundation funded effort that I have done recently, and we looked at four ways that people are saving water in the Colorado River. Like all arid basins in the world, 70 to 80% of this water goes to ag. So deficit irrigation, rotational fouling, crop switching, irrigation efficiency, and water conservation. We looked at the Colorado River Basin focus, acknowledging as Jack did earlier that um, the Colorado River Basin, the upper basin is really different in terms of ag from the lower basin. Upper basin is almost all pasture and forage because it's so high. And the lower basin is some of the prime growing areas in the United States. Imperial Irrigation District, Palo Verde Irrigation District, and the Yuma area are three places of the only places in the United States where you can grow all year round. Um, and if you like winter lettuce or any form of winter vegetables, very good chance that's where your food is coming from. So let's talk deficit irrigation. Here's a five-year-old alfalfa field that endured effectively two years of deficit irrigation. It actually looks pretty good. And so when we started looking at deficit irrigation, what is it? It's planned or even unplanned. It can be regulated or in the case of alfalfa split season where you grow alfalfa water for the first one or two or three or four cuttings and then don't water it the rest of the year. Deficit irrigation is used purposely on a whole bunch of crops, but if you're gonna use it on annuals, the life cycle's very critical. In the case of the Colorado River, alfalfa is such a huge crop, that's where our focus was. And I'll talk about alfalfa here in just a second. Alfalfa has tap roots, as you can see in that image, that actually allow it to tap water moisture, water sources, when you don't water it. Um, and it has enormous water consumption in the Colorado River Basin. In Yuma and Imperial, they will get 10 cuttings a year out of an alfalfa crop. And they will burn almost three meters, 10 feet of water in places. And so if you can deficit irrigate it, maybe that's a way to save water. The crop is often disparaged around the West. You know, I, I just saw an article in the Tucson Daily Star called it water sucking alfalfa. But if you're a farmer in the West, it's a great crop to grow for a whole bunch of reasons. So one, it's a legume, right? So it's a terrific crop in a rotation. It's the queen of forages. Uh, it supplies what has been a growing move to dairies in the Western US, including California. Uh, New Mexico and California. Uh, there's few pesticides and herbicides. Um, often uh, very little fertilizer can put on it. You need to put on it because nitrogen fixes. It has some wildlife value, unlike most annual crops. Um, you till it less. If you're a savvy farmer, you can bundle it and store it on your farm, have a steady source of income. Um, and, and it is a great crop. It's one of the few crops in the United States that actually migrated from west to east. And it's grown at sea level and at 10,000 feet. So there's at least 100 peer-reviewed studies on deficit irrigation of alfalfa. And a bunch of them date to the 1960s. They're from around the world, Spain, Cyprus, uh, many of them in the United States. And the truth is you can deficit irrigate this crop and it will come back in most cases. The issue is how long do you deficit irrigate it? 
what kind of soils. Um, and, but generally, it will rebound without weeds and without uh, crown, what they call crown loss. In the lower basin of the Colorado, they actually used to deficit irrigate it in August and sometimes September because it didn't, it doesn't, it's a cool season crop. It actually doesn't produce great value uh, at that time of year. And when they would water it prior to laser leveling, the water would pond and then scald the roots. And the solution then was actually to just not irrigate it at all. So you can deficit irrigate it and it does come back in most cases. So second area, rotational fouling. And this is one of the oldest techniques that's been used in the basin. This is the Palo Verde Valley right along the Colorado River, just a little bit north of Imperial and, and Yuma. MWD is Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, the single largest water provider in the United States. In the Los Angeles area, it delivers water to 25 million people. And in the 1990s, they started a rotational fouling pilot. And then in about the year 2000, they extended that to a 35-year deal. And it has actually worked quite well. Um, here are a whole series of other cases in the Western US. Uh, Imperial has a deal with San Diego. Um, Bard, which is in the Yuma area, has another one with Met Metropolitan. Um, and then there, uh, there's one in Yuma, and then two in the upper basin, actually, in Colorado, that uh, to some degree are copying this metropolitan deal. So it's been done in at least six different places. Um, I would argue it's a proven and successful strategy. Uh, sometimes it's not so much rotational fouling as it is temporary fouling, so fouling the same land. There are actually agronomic benefits to it, soil health, um, uh, pests, future yield increases. If you think about it, before we had chemicals and of all sorts, um, we used to foul land, right? It was a technique that we used. Uh, one of the issues that have come out of this and other water saving techniques is that impacts to water community, uh, the nearby communities are actually, can be detrimental. The seed dealer, the grocery store, everybody else can get harmed when you pay a farmer to foul land and those funds then don't follow on, flow on within the community. In the Colorado River Basin, what we've seen are these negotiations take time, uh, and several years actually, and, uh, and, and, and you need community buy-in. In salty soils, in the, which you often find in the lower Colorado River Basin, uh, through capillary action, these fallowed fields will see salt rise to the top. And so before you can replant them, you actually need to leach that, that, that off with a water application, thus reducing your water savings. The fallowed fields need to be managed, so dust and erosion, uh, weeds, and every contract I've ever seen has a, a, a relationship between the farmer and both the paying entity, in, in the case of Palo Verde Metropolitan, and the local irrigation district, where the farmer is responsible for taking care of those fields. Um, obviously, third parties are involved in monitoring water savings. And in this case, in Palo Verde, it's reclamation because they're the water master there in the lower Colorado River. Sometimes calculating how much water is saved is actually complicated uh, and, and oftentimes is done as an average of water use within that particular irrigation district for simplicity. And, and the irrigation districts in all cases end up with some funds as well to, uh, to, to, to cover the costs of managing these programs. So the third item I want to talk about is crop switching. And last week I was in Arizona and these two quotes were intriguing to me because they both indicate a desire to look at new crops. And, uh, and yet, when you really look at crop switching, you realize it is very difficult to do. A number of NGOs in the Colorado River Basin have proposed that we switch crops. And those analyses have been really simple. Alfalfa uses 10 feet of water. If we grew some other crop, you'd save six feet per acre. Why not do it without considering all the other issues? Here's a list of the different crop switching cases in the Colorado River Basin and one actually in uh, Nevada in the Walker Basin. 
And you'll see most of these actually are in the lower basin, again, where it's possible to grow a whole bunch of different crops, unlike in the upper basin where typically you, you get to grow a forage. Yuma, from 1970 to 2010, went through this amazing change in what they grew. And you can see there in the bottom image um, the growth of double cropping through time and also in the top image on the very right hand side there that move to vegetables you got 1970 in one part and then 2010 in, an, in another and in so doing you actually saved about 200,000 acre feet of water per year uh, close to about 20 percent of their allocation so there in the upper chart you can see through time uh, Yuma's uh, reduction in water use and then you can on in the bottom graph you can actually see the double cropping that they now do um, and it's a little hard for me to even see those images but uh, what they have done is is save water through double cropping they figured out at some point in about oh, 1980 that this winter market for vegetables was enormously profitable and and went down that path they didn't do this to save water and in in our study you will not find except for one case of anyone actually moving to another crop to save water and that case is unusual i'll just mention it it's six there it's the walker basin in nevada harry reed senator harry reed got about 300 million dollars to convert the walker basin from alfalfa to vegetables it took an enormous amount of money, an enormous amount of time, and it's the one case out there where you can find that someone actually did this to save water. So easy to talk about, really hard to do. And I mentioned it's occurred historically for market-driven reasons in California that shift to nuts and avocados and Yuma and, and imperial leafy green veggies were all market-driven. The saved water obviously is just the difference between the crops, oftentimes alfalfa uh, you know, being the one that you switch out of. And if you were to do this in some great way and switch out alfalfa, you you'd have an interesting issue with your market, right? Because you'd, the, 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 that forage is widely used by dairies in California and, and southern Arizona. Uh, and you would bring the price of alfalfa up if you ever did this in a major way. More opportunities to do this in the lower basin, as I mentioned. Um, and here's the constraints. I mean, if you're gonna grow a new crop, you need to have the right climate, the right soils. You need to think about weed and pest risk. You need to think about water quality. One of the issues in that Nevada Walker Basin swat switch was that they had to move to groundwater, actually, away from surface water because the surface water quality was not high enough to grow the vegetables that they wanted to move to. You might need new farm equipment, uh, new kinds of labor, crop storage, and, and agronomic knowledge. So there are all these on-farm issues if you're gonna make a crop switch. And then off-farm, you know, where's your market? Uh, are there risk instruments out there if you're gonna grow this new crop to help, uh, to help manage that risk? Are there processing facilities or marketing organizations? I know that within the NGO community in the Colorado River Basin, there's an interest at least in trying to step into some of this and, and help provide the capital to build some of these facilities and risk instruments that might be needed to switch crops. And within the water right world of the Western US, this crazy doctrine of prior appropriation, you'd actually need to transfer the saved water right when you switch it, not at some later time, the way our water law works. So here's the final area I wanna talk about, which is irrigation efficiency and water conservation. And these are all out of Yuma. I mean, the upper left image there is the obvious one, right? The line your canal. Um, the, that's the upper left. Upper right is these high flow turnouts. So in combination with laser leveling, lower left there, what you wanna do is get water on these fields at the right amount so it flows across the field evenly and quickly and, and so that you don't over irrigate the upper end and under irrigate the lower end of your field, which is a common issue. 
And then finally, this innovative, innovative technique with what are called bola wheels on that tractor to try and push these furrows down and make, again, the, so the water infiltrates at the right rate. And this all came out of Yuma. Here's 13 different cases around the West of where irrigation efficiency and water conservation has been pursued. And Yuma's in there. There's others um, throughout the West. And uh, a couple of them in Colorado. These were often pursued actually for other purposes. The, the ones labeled two and three in Colorado were actually done for endangered species issues. They figured out through irrigation efficiency you could actually leave more water in the river and operate a canal that was 60 miles long uh, in a more efficient way. Historically, what had gone on in this canal was they just kept it full. And oftentimes, it spilled out at the end you know, back into the river, but dewatered about a 20-mile section of the river with computerized controls, uh, checks, and a small operational reservoir, they can actually divert less and yet supply the same amount of water. And that overall consumptive use is, is about the same. Another measure in Yuma here is to get these uh, veggies to germinate, they used to sub-irrigate there, shown on the left. So they keep water in the field for oh, 10 days, two weeks, or more. And now they use these movable sprinklers to get the crops germinated, which, use, uh, which uses less water. The image here comes from the NRCS. And it's the classic problem with uh, irrigated, often furrow, furrow irrigated or flood irrigated fields. And you can see on the left there where you over irrigate the top end, you under irrigate the bottom end. And through high flow turnouts, through those bolo wheels, um, you can try and reduce that. And I'll show you a second image here where that goes down. Um, these two terms have a lot of passion. Irrigation efficiency is actually just an engineering term, and it's an output divided by an input. So in this case, you might get consumptive water consumptively used as your output, and your input is how much you divert out of the head gate. The term water conservation really has no standard definition to it, and it, it creates a lot of problems. Both definitions seem to have great connotation with the public, and yet those connotations, I'd argue, are sometimes divorced from reality. Because irrigation efficiency, in the water sense, follows the law of conservation of mass, not the law of conservation of energy, which is what we often think about, miles per gallon, right? Public thinks efficiency is good, yet they don't understand in the water sense that water that's the inefficient portion, that actually is a return flow somewhere. Something is dependent upon that. Uh, in the case of Imperial Irrigation District, that something is the Salton Sea, which has enormous value. And in recent years, all the efficiency improvements have reduced those flows. Now to the idea that the state of California committed $400 million and probably over a billion to somehow stabilize the Salton Sea so it doesn't become a source of toxic selenium uh, wind dust. So return flows and irrigation efficiency are joined at the hip. So there's the second image. And what you can see is you've tried to reduce the over and, and reduce the under by being savvy about how you apply water. But um, you know, again, the inefficiencies that, that, that are part of improving efficiency oftentimes are really good things or go to some other use. Um, within the Colorado River Basin, they lined a 20-mile section of the All-American Canal. That water ended up, uh, historically went into Mexico, where it was pumped for groundwater. And it is one of the reasons why U.S. and Mexican relationships, at least in the early, late 1990s and early 2000s, were on, on the rocks. <clears throat> so when you deal with these irrigation efficiency improvements, you can look at it both on-farm or off-farm, on-farm district-wide. And the obvious things that everybody knows about, canal lining and piping. Um, and then I've mentioned all these field application efficiency techniques from turnouts that use higher volumes, laser leveling, tailwater recovery, so get the water at the end of the field and reuse it. 
uh, sprinklers, potentially drip irrigation or and irrigation scheduling. And then district-wide efforts look much the same. And, and then also these computerized control systems and operational reservoirs to avoid <coughs> spills. And I'm gonna skip that image in the interest of time. When you improve irrigation efficiency, you oftentimes get co-benefits. So you get improved water quality. And that translates into fewer contaminants because you're actually having less water being applied to the field and then run off as a return flow. You can get higher reliability diversions because you need less carriage water to get water to your field. Um, and this modern automated management actually gives you the opportunity to use less labor and more flexibility. If you think about it, these techniques like drip and sprinklers remove two constraints from water use. So one is a labor constraint. You can flip a button to apply water. You know, you're not limited to, for example, a, a run every week, for example, as often as the case in irrigated fields in the American West. And then because you apply water more evenly across the field, you don't over-irrigate the upper end and under-irrigate the lower, which means you actually get better yield out of your crops. But it also means your consumptive use goes up. And there are a whole bunch of studies that actually now show this. It, if you improve these systems through irrigation efficiency, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to increase consumptive use, but it does certainly provide the opportunity for that. So what are the lessons for these other basins? Um, I would argue the Colorado River Basin is at the forefront of these stresses that we're now seeing around the world, population within the United States, population growth, um, water stress that includes climate change and, and increasing aridity through drought. Uh, municipalities and NGOs have been pushing these ideas with, with, some, uh, with, with, with some benefit and, and with some acceptance. There are certainly farming communities that don't like these ideas, but deficit irrigation, it works. It hasn't been used very much. Uh, Crop switching, it works, but it's really hard to do, and a lot of things have to align for producers to buy into it and be able to do it. Rotational fouling works. It's the original technique, but perhaps it's the least desirable because it actually takes lands out of production. Uh, and then finally, irrigation efficiency, it, it works. It can increase consumptive use, and there are a whole bunch of co-benefits that go along with it. I kind of like this. Uh, I don't mind getting married for better or worse. It's not as long as it's not a whole lot worse. So municipalities and, and NGOs and the producing community trying to figure out how to, how to solve problems. And I think that's uh, one of the things you see nowadays in the Colorado River Basin. And with that, I'll end. Thank you. question while well, I invite or ask every speaker let's all sit up here and let's all have a conversation Luna Jerry Rob anybody have a question for Brad while we move there you go Brad sure You know, Central Arizona Project has a 330 mile long canal and this repeatedly comes up. There have been talk about covering it with solar panels. They claim that it's just not worth it and the evaporative loss doesn't, wouldn't, you wouldn't save. Um, Lake Mead evaporative loss is roughly, Jack knows these numbers, maybe six feet. I mean, it's significant. Um, yes. Yeah. So, you know, at some point we may come to that and these really ba big canal systems, absolutely yes, but the economics aren't there right now. So, um, we now occupied lots of airspace. Um, so let's have a conversation. Anybody want to make, I mean, we don't really have to be sitting at this elevation, but let's keep <laughs> stay at this. Um, any observations, comments? on any of the talks or how they fit together or their relevance? Yes, sir. I like the way this comment in Spanish, but Chris told me, no, you have to speak. <laughs> <laughs> so there's two comments. One, there's one 
related to those boundary conflict on water between two countries eh? that uh, one of the speakers did this afternoon. Did <coughs> this afternoon. We are an island, in Hispaniola Island, uh, 30,000 square mile only, 20 million of population, one of the top populated in the, in the whole Latin American, and with Haiti beside us, the, the poorest country in La all American. And a big problem is migration of Haitian to the Dominican Republic, more than 1.5 million illegal migrants, uh, around 10 million that we have is a 15% of our, our population. And water boundary problem is the solution to migration. That Haiti does not have any water regulated. And it has a big river, no regulated, and that has a conflict of usage between the Haitian, con the Haiti con uh, country and the Dominican Republic. That's the Artibonito River, the biggest one in the whole island, 9,000 square kilometers of basin. And that problem is a big problem with a lot of consequences. Migration, poverty, development, and stability of two countries. And what is the problem? The problem is that Haiti constitution do not allow that, that that river should be regulated if hit the boundary of the Dominican Republic. So the historian problem that is impacting both countries. Anyone want to uh, comment on that? Uh, Luna, you had brought up uh, the issues uh, in your presentation between uh, the different countries in the Gangi. Uh, River basin and hydropower. You mentioned hydropower. Jack, uh, Jack mentioned uh, the problems that hydropower caused on the Colorado River. And uh, and would you like to address uh, issues between countries and maybe the hydropower question? Yeah, as I also mentioned earlier, I mean, in a lot of the river basins where I've worked. Um, it's not the resource, the water resource, that's the problem. It's more the geopolitics and management influenced by the geopolitics. Because if everyone would get along, I mean, at least in the Ganges, there's sufficient water. But, you know, because politics enters and then there's competition and conflict. And so, yeah, that's unfortunate. Yeah. I would just mention that in the Missouri River, it's really the states are acting like countries. The states are very much um, in disagreement with each other about, about water management policies. The, at one point, historically, there was a Missouri River Basin Association, which was uh, set up to, to address these interstate issues. And that was, I think, abolished during the Nixon administration. And nothing has come back. But other states do have compacts. And and uh, like the Delaware Commission, the Potomac Commission, and and they've been very successful. I think I would ask other members on the panel here to comment on that. So the Colorado has the original U.S. River Compact, right, 1922, signed amongst the seven states, and arguably. It got better in 1963 when the federal government got a large role in management of the river in the lower basin. And what seems to happen nowadays is that because the feds have such a large role, they actually can threaten to do really bad things unless the states agree. And that turns out to be a really good thing. In 2005, in the middle of the drought or four, Interior Secretary Gail Norton told the states, you solve the structural deficit or I will. And, the, and by 2007, they came up with half a solution. They still got half to go, but within three years, they actually got there. And, and I would argue that the Colorado River Basin, Jack, you may feel differently, is one of the best places in the United States where this is going on, but it be, exists because of this federal oversight role that the feds actually never use, but can threaten. Yeah. Thank you. These have been very interesting presentations, I guess. 
uh, one of my comments would be we've had a great deal of focus on quantity and maybe not as much on quality. Uh, this question, I guess, is for the lady from India and Nepal. Uh, your presentation was very good, and one of the points that you made was that 75% of the wastewater goes into the river untreated, and you just a minute ago reaffirmed that there's plenty of quantity. Uh, leaving 75% of the wastewater untreated doesn't do much for quality, as we know. And I wonder if there's a program underway to uh, to begin treating that wastewater so that you can enhance the quality of the river as well as the quantity. Thank you. Yeah, okay, so at least in India, the current government, as well as the past government, there's this uh, Clean Ganga initiative, which the government has started, but it hasn't really uh, been very successful so far. But at least uh, people are getting together and talking about where, I mean, what the pollution sources are, um, because, you know, even that hasn't been properly quantified, and managing yeah, the pollutant loads, I mean, it's it's opening up sort of a can of worms So because there's domestic, you know, sewage going straight to the river. And so uh, one of the work that my organization is doing is a lot of the households, they actually has, have septic tanks because they don't have, you know, these drainage canals in a lot of these cities. And so, to, but but people don't clean out the septic tanks, and so then what happens is it overflows and then goes into the river. So working uh, with um, the sort of a private public part in private public partnership to convert human waste into nutrient pellets that can be used for as for as nutrients for fertilization as fertilizer and so that's you know that's just for the urban areas but then the non-point source pollution coming from agriculture it's not documented no one knows how much it is so it's it's just it's a huge problem and this whole p dilution issue um, okay, during the monsoon, there's plenty of water and plenty of flow, so the you know the water is also then diluted. But it's the dry season, that's a, that's the main issue, and that's also when irrigation water is abstracted. So you know already the flows are low, and then you know there's more water being abstracted. So, but there is from the international community, World Bank. Um, Asian Development Bank also want to invest in treatment plants. They've also built treatment plants. But unfortunately, a lot, a lot of them are, you know, they, they get built, but they're not functional. Why? Because they don't have sufficient energy resources. So a couple of the plants they built in Kathmandu, they're just sitting there uh, not operating. So it's, yes, yeah, it's, it's a lot of combination of a lot of things but but it in it might change in a decade because as i said the current indian government as well as you know world bank adb they're put they're pushing a lot of money into solving at least the ganges pollution issues you know it better than i do so there's another form of pollutant salinity right that causes problems worldwide and it's a real issue in the colorado river there's a international uh, uh, what's called a minute an amendment to our treaty with mexico on salinity that requires us to deliver water that's within a certain delta of the water that's used by u.s farmers um, and it's fairly restrictive, this delta. At one point in the 1970s, an irrigation district near Yuma decided they were gonna pump out a whole bunch of groundwater that turned out to have 6,000 parts per million salinity in it, 1,000 being about what you can get away with. And that caused the international incident that led to the this treaty minute, Minute 242. Um, these issues are not going away in the Colorado River Basin. They're, they're watched, and uh, but we have these amazing natural sources of salinity within the basin, and then we also concentrate it by diverting water out of the basin that's quite pure. So there's sort of two issues, natural sources and the concentration issue within our basin. Yeah, I wanted to ask, I guess, a two-part question. One to Jerry. Um, I believe in the original um, settlement on the FERC licensing, the goal was to get 417,000 acre feet a year. And, you, and then the states and the Fish and Wildlife Service agreed to 120 or 40 or something like that. Um, so what's the thinking about that other two thirds that we aren't really focusing on? And then a bigger question maybe for, for the panel 
environmental demand for water in these basins is huge. And where are we at in terms of accurately quantifying that need for that environmental demand? So uh, with regard to the, uh, the first part, yeah, so if you go back to the, you know, the, the, you know, those blocks, the target flows, and, and look at the, at the deficit to target flows under you know, average conditions, they, that, that roughly was the 417,000 acre foot number. And that, I mean, that's still out there. That, that's still sort of a hammer that, that can be waved from, from time to time. So for for the first increment, which is you know, what got agreed to, it was a negotiated settlement. 130 to 150 is what we'll try and try and meet. Now, uh, there's as I indicated, we're we're talking about 120,000 now. So, but uh, part of that agreement is to you know take a hard look at the target flows. Do the science to figure out what is, uh, yeah, a more accurate, a more defensible uh, understanding of what what is really needed, and uh, you know, determine is 120 enough? Is is yeah? You know, do we need more? What what should the real number be for for the species? So, uh, yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. Not definitively resolved, uh, but that's where we're at. And and it, but it is known to be a question that 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 needs answered. What what really is necessary to create you know a a, a healthy ecosystem in the in, in the plat? Why don't um, we're, who's got the mic? Why don't you give? Oh, Brian. Uh, why don't you answer the question? Yeah. Well, I know more. Yeah, this is Brian Richter, who is uh, one of the preeminent uh, scientists in the country who studies uh, that question. What's your take on the whole thing? On the, the latter part of his question yeah. about wh where we're at with yeah. uh, determining the environmental yeah. water demand. Well, you know, it's been... Um, it's been largely pretty site specific. So there's really, really excellent science work that's been done in different pieces, say, of the Colorado River system, and certainly on the, on the plat, that would be the same. So we know a lot about the Green River below Flaming Gorge Reservoir on the Green River. We know a lot about flows in the Grand Canyon. We know a lot now about the flows that are necessary to bring the Colorado River Delta back to some, you know, to, to some ecological, you know, improvements there. Um, but um, but there's you know huge gaps you know in between you know in, in terms of those little sort of spatial nodes and so comprehensively no we haven't done it um, is anybody taking it seriously uh, you know at that kind of scale I don't think so um, so I, I'm sorry I can't end this on a more positive note that's as far as I can get with it. Let me just say that in Colorado, we're in the process of trying to develop stream management plans, which are effectively environmental plans for the state. And it comes out of our recently released Colorado water plan. We'll see how this works, but it's one place where I would argue there's at least a, an integrative statewide effort to get this done. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, in South Asia, I would say it's at its infancy. It's only been probably not longer than six or seven years um, where environmental flows have, I mean, environmental flow assessments are being carried out, but they're all in, you know, sort of a haphazardly w the done way. So, it, and it hasn't really made it into legislation. In Nepal, it's just starting. Uh, um, I was uh, actually part of uh, one of the first groups in India that did a uh, environmental flow assessment for the Ganges, and at that time, you know, we used this building block methodology developed in South Africa, and the in, and we got all these different groups of pe people representing you know different aspects of environmental flows, and the environmentalists were like so happy because up till until that time, 
it was either for or against. And the environmentalists, they were like going on hunger strikes. I mean, they still go on hunger strikes, but <laughs> anyway, so, uh, but this environmental flow assessment actually gave them a method to come and negotiate, sit at a, sit a, sit in a table with the dam engineers, with the irrigation engineers, and demand a certain amount of water. And so they were really excited about this, uh, you know, whole methodology. And at the moment, and in India, they're, you know, they're, I mean, they're doing the science behind it to also come up with good assessments that support, uh, you know, these species that they're representing. In Nepal, it's just starting out. And so, yeah. So an example from the river I'm most uh, familiar with on, on the Missouri River where <clears throat> water quantity isn't that much of a problem. We usually have plenty of, as long as we're generating uh, navigation flows and generating power, there's, there's going to be enough water there. But the environmental flow questions come down to very specific questions about behavioral and ecological responses, and it's driven by the Endangered Species Act. So there's been a, you know, an, an effort to design exactly what a spawning queue flow is for a pallid sturgeon. Nobody knows. Uh, a lot of science is going into that, but that's that's sort of risen the bar on 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 um, environmental flows, uh, especially because everybody uh, is concerned about any sort of commitment to flows. Do you really? They ask the scientists, do you really know what is needed? And a couple of years ago, we wrote a paper about we went back to the natural flow regime and said, well, you could use the natural flow regime to sort of shrink shrink things down and. The sort of transparency approach and, and say, okay, here's what your environmental flows could be. And it was absolutely dead on arrival uh, because it would not be accepted by the agricultural community. They said, no, if you're going to do something, this environmental flow, you got to tell us with great confidence what it is and that it's going to work. And we're not there yet. I, I would just, um, just a few other thoughts. Um, about environmental flows. Um, I think it's easier to define the base flow needs of a river. It's easier to identify sort of a minimum flow regime that will get spe aquatic species through rough times. Um, it gets much more controversial when you start talking about what are the flood flows necessary to create and maintain habitats and the physical structure of rivers, that's a harder thing. Uh, I'd say that overall, it's easier to define environmental flows on gravel bed rivers and rivers with relatively little sediment transport. Um, and most of the paradigms about environmental flows are developed for rivers that are assumed or presumed or imagined to be in equilibrium which is a very loaded word in geomorphology. And um, many of the river systems um, in the American West are distinctly not in equilibrium and never have been. They're uh, disequilibrium rivers. Um, one of the biggest struggles in the rivers that we talked about um, in the Missouri Rio Grande and Colorado is rivers with very high suspended sediment transport. And in those kind of rivers, it's very hard to just make up a form, have a formulaic approach to how to maintain habitat. Sediment transport is often conveniently ignored because it's hard and uncertain. Um, but it's the crux of maintaining habitat. So a thing that we uh, developed at the Grand Canyon Monitoring Research Center when I was running that center that we've expanded on other rivers in the West is strategies to continuously measure sediment fluxes that can be linked to specific flow regime changes to know whether particular flow regimes accumulate or evacuate sediments. The last thing I would say is no matter how hard it is for Rob to just say, you know, here's a specific species, here's a specific station's life history, what, oh, we just want to know the number. And Rob said, well, we can't do that. And yet I would submit it's, e it's much easier if the problem has a small spatial scale, has one species 
or has one life, you know, one segment of its life history. It, that's a tractable scientific question. What happens that gets really, really hard is when you take a long river, because as soon as you go to a long river, you can potentially have multiple objectives in different places. Each species, each objective, each attribute of the ecosystem might have its own cues. And suddenly the whole scientific question gets swamped in multiple different values, which inevitably lead one back to saying, well, it's sort of the natural flow regime. I mean, you do a lot of science, but when you smush it all together over a long river, it's sort of like, well, it's the way it was. And so then when you look at the plots I showed for the Colorado River Delta, where there's no way in the world you're gonna put that back, or the forgotten reach of the Rio Grande, there's no way you're gonna restore 99% of the flow. You're just creating artificial rivers that we are making up. You're not recreating nature at all, and we have to grapple with it. We have two more questions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, really, I think um, directed at Brad, but uh, Jack, please chime in, and Jerry as well. You know, after what you said about the level of flow depletion that's taking place in the Platte River, I think my question is going to be pertinent there and many, many river, other rivers across the United States and, and internationally. And it has to do with. You know, Brad, I'm really troubled by the water math in the Colorado River Basin. And you know, you and I have talked about this, and it's not that we don't know what the math is, but, but it's where the projections are going. You know, the river no longer makes it to the delta, so we're virtually con entirely consumptively using the river as it is. Um, you pointed out, you know, you showed the graphs of the declines in Lake Mead water levels over time. You know, I think most of us think that that's not going to correct itself over the long term and, and things are not going to get back to sort of the normal that we, that we thought we had there for a few decades. The population projections for the basin, you know, um, just breathtaking. Um, your, your points about the, uh, with climate change, uh, 20 to 35 percent less flow in the basin. So for me, it just seems like we're suspending disbelief somehow in the basin. And, and the activities that I see by any parties or all parties just seems to be really fiddling while Rome burns. It's just like barely putting a dent in the, in the problem. I mean, the system conservation pro uh, program, you know, put uh, in its best year, put less than 0.1% of the flow back. Um, so, uh, what are your thoughts about where we're headed here, you know, in the, in the next three or four decades? I mean, is there going to be a day of reckoning or, or, and who, or who's going to be the white knight that steps in and, and helps to fix this problem? What a lovely question. <laughs> Let me get the tape recorder. <laughs> yeah. yeah, is the tape recorder off? Um, you know, that, part of the reason we released that paper over Peck and I did was to try and get people talking about the long range future of the river. Cause that paper actually talks a lot about policy, not just the science, but also where the policy is right now. And I mean, clearly we humans love to kick the can down the road. And I, I mean, I don't, we've been talking kick the can down the road, every speaker here, I think today. And we humans don't act until something very, very serious comes at us. And, and I don't know what that trigger will be. You know, I work in the climate change space, and frankly, my trigger worldwide on climate change action is sea level rise. I mean, we now have bitten off probably 15 meters, or 15 feet, five meters out of West Antarctica. This was predicted in 1978. West Antarctica is the left side. If you look at Antarctica, there's not land under that ice. There's ocean. Those ice sheets actually extend below sea level, and they're now being eaten from below by warm uh, Antarctic waters, right? And it looks like once you start this, it will not stop. 15 feet is a major hit to the world in terms of livability. And within the US, it's 12 million people out of their homes. Um, at some point, some of these bigger sustainability issues are gonna have to get looked at through, through a very harsh lens in how we deal with it. And I don't know what it is, but I think we're sleepwalking here. Well, you uh, mentioned the plat and that 
I, I decided 70 to 80 percent of the the flow in the plot is at the you know, at this point diverted. So um, that's why I always speak about rehabilitating habitat. We're not restoring the Platte River to anything uh, of its of its condition uh, prior to development. It's it's what we're creating is really sort of Platte River light. So instead of a mile wide, you know. We've got about a quarter of the flow. It'll it'll be a quarter of a mile wide, but that quarter mile will be you know usable habitat for the for the species. So you know it's 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 doing good, but it is not it it is not a restoration to to what it was. So um, uh, and that seems to be doing good. Uh, that 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 seems to be beneficial to the recovery of the species. So, uh, uh, live with that and move on. Jerry, what's what's the long? Sorry to follow up. But what's you know in the Colorado? You know all the all the projections are all seem to be going in the wrong direction. You know it's going to get harder and harder. What's the situation in the plot? I'm not really. I mean, it's uh, in terms of population. Any growth in water demand projected, you know, in the coming decades, or do you have a situation where you feel that if you can get this flow restoration habitat—not flow restoration, but flow, some degree of flow recovery, some degree of habitat recovery—that you may be pretty good for a while, or, or what's the long-term prospect? Uh, I think there are a couple, a couple, you know, sort of counterbalancing. Forces so population is going to increase largely, you know, Denver metro area. Uh, population will increase somewhat in Nebraska, but it'll be at the downstream end of the Platte Basin. You know, the Lincoln and the Omaha's, maybe some in the I-80 corridor. You know, as, as Brad mentioned, Wyoming. Now, you know, it it's not going to uh, population isn't going to be a uh, an issue there. But I think uh, so. Well. Urban demands, but there will be you know, improved efficiency in, in urban demand as well. So the population will grow, but they'll be better uh, able to manage that. And a lot of the things that Brad was talking about in terms of, of things that can be done in agriculture, which which uh, will utilize less water, I think I think it will drive in that in in that fashion. So yeah, I think if we can if we can carve out uh, a, you know the 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 goals the water goals that we've got and and maintain those um and then throw in climate change i mean there's you know the 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 plat basin is it, you know depending on which model you look at uh precipitation doesn't always change that much but temperature w will increase which will uh increase evaporation so there would even if it rains as much, you know, as, as we're seeing in the Colorado, there will still be less water available, and it will probably come at a different time. So, storage will be a, you know, Im important aspect of that. But, uncharacteristically, I remain optimistic that if we can get her done, it'll, uh, uh, it'll stick for, for you know, the foreseeable future. Um, let me just go back to. What I tried to talk about this morning or, or earlier today, maybe I didn't do such a good job, but I mean, I would argue that geography matters. It's not just, you know, these crossing lines of demand and supply. I, I'm very optimistic about the Colorado River. And the reason, no, I'm very optimistic about most of the Colorado River. And, I mean, I've tried to relentlessly change the conversation about the Colorado River for a decade, maybe unsuccessfully, to say there's only one tiny little part of the Colorado River that really is dewatered. And so, you know, the saviors of the Colorado River is that it's all alfalfa and pasture grass. There's going to have to be some day of reckoning on that but that's a savior there's really only one big problem in the state of in the upper basin and that's the state of colorado 
Thankfully, a whole lot of good friends who are liberally minded and care about water live there, like the guy next to me. And so someday that will change. But the truth of the matter is, there's the dominant, they're the dominant user of water in the Rio Grande. They use more than a million acre feet of consumptive water use in Colorado. Upstream big demands of water are a problem. But you're always going to have a whole lot of water going through the Grand Canyon. You're always going to have a whole lot of water going through the Green River because you're sucking that downstream. Now, the delta is essentially a write-off. We have a feel-good event. It watered the trees. There's zero attempt to restore a river there. It was a pulse. It happened for two months. It watered plants and then the river is bone dry again. Um, but that's not a bad thing. We've made the world a better place down there. It's, it's not, so that's a place the solution's really hard. But I think the geography of the Colorado River with you, where you have senior water rights and high-end crops at the lower downstream end means that most of the upstream end is always gonna have, have flow and I would submit that there's going to be a way to renegotiate the deals that also protect the river to have a really viable river ecosystem in much of the upper basin. In contrast, if you want to know how bad it can ever get, that's the Rio Grande. And the Rio Grande is probably going to get worse. And you've got a completely emasculated river for most of the state of New Mexico and the international border. And our, we can't even get an environmental group to care about the river along the border. So, I mean, it depends where. I, I would, uh, that's what I would say. Um, Great, follow up on that. One, oh, okay. I just want to follow up on that geography issue. I think, well, actually, Jack and I went to grad school at the same time in the same place, so. It just makes sense we would see things the same way. But geography really is important. I think it's really interesting that, you know, about the mouth of the Platte River, you go from systems that are really, you know, just waters the currency to the Missouri River where suddenly it's all about nitrogen. And so as you move east, it's not so, you know, there's, there's a lot of flexibility in terms of how to manage the water resource, but the water quality then becomes a much bigger, bigger issue. A couple of you have touched on um, pulse flows, and we've talked about this just with that prior question, but I'm curious if there's been any work studying the effectiveness of those releases from upstream dams on, on habitat, on ecosystems, and whether they've proven effective as a way to, to get some water. Not, not permanent in-stream flow, but those pulse flows. Except for Jack or? Uh, anyone. anyone. Um, pulse flows have been a big issue on the Missouri River, um, both for uh, the reasons I put out, uh, floodplain connectivity, building sandbars, and that building sandbars hypothesis is common to the Platte River, is common to the Colorado River as well. The idea that the endangered birds need to have bare sandbars, and you can build them with diesel fuel or you can build them with, with water. And uh, I made the mistake of assuming that uh, diesel fuel was more expensive. Um, so, um, so there have been studies in all these rivers. In the Missouri River, uh, there's been quite a bit of work done recently because we have this new management plan that's been going over everything that's known and not known about what those pulse flows can do in terms of creating the habitat uh, in, and uh, maintaining the habitat. And also, this long-lasting question is about whether a pulse flow can make a pallid sturgeon romantic. A very difficult question to answer, and it, it remains unanswered right now. So, um, uh, pulse flows in Grand Canyon. Uh, the great contribution of the Obama administration was to codify the protocol by which we can have floods in any year that there is a little bit of supply by one tributary that comes in just below the dam. We're basically trying to manage and make the most of what's essentially three to four percent 
of the pre dam supply of sediment. The other 95 plus percent is trapped upstream of Lake Powell. But there's this tiny little amount that dribbles in from one tributary. We have a protocol in place that makes the most of that. And generally, the bars look better. And that's all for the good. I, as with everything, there are now ecological uh, consequences that are now throwing people for a loop. But basically, that's a good thing for sandbars. But it's certainly nothing remotely to constitute a natural ecosystem disturbance like a flood. Down in the delta, I think um, it's been beneficial to giving a boost to the riparian species. We, essentially, it was a tree watering event. But ironically, the most improvement down in the delta occurred where conservation groups had done a tremendous amount of on the ground clearing and manipulating of the ground prior to being inundated. So they could prepare the land to make the most to benefit the target environmental species. Um, on, at Flaming Gorge Dam on the Green River, pulse flow releases are being used not for sediment or geomorphology, but to target and create a pulse of flow to benefit them, the drift of target native fish in their larval stage. And that's with tremendous positive benefit. Fish biologists are tremendously excited about it. So that's a big success story. And those, those are a couple. And those flows are directed also against invasive species. So a little different mental model on how you can use a dam release to try and knock back an invasive species. Yeah. Okay, in the Ganges, um, basically the flow releases from the projects, they're not done uh, with any consideration to the environmental flows. And so it's turning out to be almost negative because a lot of these hydropower projects, they just you know release water. But without thinking about the consequences. And so, you know, there needs to be more studies done on how exactly the flow releases should happen. And that's ongoing, but it's just started. And on the plat, we spent a lot of time uh, dealing with that question. You know, the, the, the big question with that, that we are trying to, to answer is, you know, what is the balance between the mechanical uh, manipulation of the channel to create the environment and how much can be accomplished by letting the river do the do the work and and uh, the, when I spoke of the one question that we did find an answer to you know, the, the the question was well if you have five to eight thousand CFS three to five uh, for three to five days two out of three years will it build suitable uh, habitat for the turn plover in the river and the answer to that was no no it won't yeah, it, it will build sandbars, but it will build them up to a height that you're probably 90% certain that they will get flooded at some point during the nesting fledging stage. So, so if if you're relying on that to build islands, you're building a death trap. So stop doing stop doing that. But uh, what we are finding, you know, on the uh, on the what flows are effective in in plan form changing. Uh, uh, conditions, and that is in excess of 12,000 CFS for 40 days duration. And you know, we are, you know, 120,000 acre feet is not going to get us the ability to do that. And a lot of cities along the plot are not going to be happy if we, you know, did that. So, so uh, you know, where we're coming to on that point is, well, we can't manage it for that. We can't create that. But when it happens, don't mess with it. Don't try and you know skim those peaks off to put them in storage somewhere else or divert them to some other basin. Just just you know, they only have, uh, on the plat. They'll only happen you know once every 15, 20 years. But when they do, stand back and let them do their work. Just not what, and that's exactly not what the water managers want, right? They think those peak flows are theirs. It's waste. It's waste, and that's the easy flow to go get. I'm 
we probably got to go, but I want to ask one quick question. So in 2013, I lived through 17 inches of rain in Boulder in a week. That's our annual rainfall. You may have heard about the Boulder floods. It all went down the South Platte. What happened? Uh, Pat, <laughs> past North Platte, there was no out-of-bank flow. It, uh, it, it, was a, it was one of the events that, uh, you know, really in, in the Central Platte it was not damaging. It, it, it provided us with an oppor opportunistic uh, event that allowed us to collect a lot of data to uh, be able to draw the conclusion that, you know, 12,000 for more than 40 days, uh, 13, so the South Platte's been pretty good for several events in and the past. Number, you just, that 12,000 CFS for 40 days, that's a million acre feet. Do the math. It's a million acre yeah. feet. Yeah, I mean, that's part of, we cannot manage for that. We don't have the resources to, to, to make those kind of, kind of releases, nor, you know, would we be allowed to if, if we could. Huh. Well, uh, I think uh, we've come to the end of the session. Let's give a big round of applause to the uh, um, speakers. Thank you very much for attending and for the great presentations and discussion.